Today we are in Philippians chapter 2, verse 19. So if you need a Bible, if you need a Bible, please raise your hand and um, the um, ushers will bring you a Bible, I think. Okay, yeah, I caught you off guard. Go ahead and um, um, raise your hand if you need a Bible, the ushers will bring you one. If you don't own a Bible, go ahead and just keep it. So, um, first we're in Philippians chapter 2, verse 19 to 30. So I'm going to open up with this. Do you guys know who William Clark is? Anybody know William Clark? How about um, Meriwether Lewis? Okay, so, so you hear their names individually, you may not know them. But if you hear the phrase Lewis and Clark, go, oh, yeah, we know Lewis and Clark. So there's a duo there, a duo there that they come together and there's meaning to their name. Separately, you may not know much about them. A name like Meriwether, it's hard to forget. I bet he got beat up a lot as a kid. How, here's some other duos from our culture. How about um, Laurel and Hardy? Martin and Lewis. This is more my age, I understand. You know, um, here's my favorite. Tom and Terry. I should have got a picture of them up there. Um, see, these, these people come together and they're greater together than they are apart. I want you to think about that for a minute. Lewis and Clark did amazing things. Someone that, that, that no one had ever done before in our country. They were looking for the Northwest Passage and they never found it. But they went all the way from Missouri all the way to Oregon coast through the plains and the mountains. Did amazing things. But you hear their names individually. It's not important. But together they accomplished amazing things. Today we're going to talk about Paul and two of his companions. Now, Paul had many companions. We're going to talk today about Timothy and Epaphroditus. Because Paul is, is addressing the Philippians to tell them about these two men who are coming to visit them. First of all, Timothy was a traveler with Paul or a co-missionary a co with Paul. Where Epaphroditus was the Philippians emissary to Paul. And Paul was sending him home. So I want to talk about these two gentlemen and their ministry with Paul. And try and pull some principles out for us. So let's just ask God to guide us. Father, as we read your word today and we talk about it, Lord, so guide us, Father. Teach us. Um, show us what's important for us to live our lives today. And we look forward to see how you're going to work in us today and this week as we implement the principles from your word. In Christ's name, I thank you. Amen. So first, let's talk about Timothy. I call him the faithful son. If you know in your notes, I put him in quote marks, son, because Paul was, Timothy was not Paul's literal son. But he calls Timothy my son on many occasions. And, and so let, let me just walk through Paul's journey and how he came on with, came to meet Timothy. If you remember, we went through the book of Acts. In Acts 13, Paul goes out on what's called the first missionary journey. He went with Barnabas. And they actually just went from, from the, the Palestinian area of the, the um, Near East. They just went to Asia Minor, which is Turkey. And they visited several cities, but there was three cities together. Derby, Lystra, and Iconium. And that is where Paul met Timothy. Now, if, if you think about it, if you look at a map, Paul grew up 90 miles from there in Tarsus. And Paul seems to know Timothy's mother and grandmother, Lois and Eunice. Lois and Eunice were Jewish women. And then Eunice, Timothy's mother, had married a Gentile man. So Timothy grows up in a home that is led by a Jewish woman and a Gentile man. There's a good chance Paul knew them before he went there on a missionary journey. It's only 90 miles. So think, think you know, Lystra, Iconium, and Derby. Think this. Think, think, um, oh, think Incline Village, Tahoe City, and Truckee. That's how they're situated to each other. Then think 90 miles away, go down to um, um, Auburn. That's where Paul grew up. There's a good chance Paul had been to these towns in his life and probably met these Jewish women, Eunice and... Um, Lois. We don't know that for sure. But so Paul does his first missionary journey, goes back to Jerusalem, reports to the Jerusalem council and the elders, and they go off on their second one. Him and Barnabas have a tiff. They have a fight. Barnabas goes off to Cyprus. Paul heads back out. Paul grabs Silas, one of his traveling companions, and they head back to visit all these churches. When they get to Lystra, Paul picks up Timothy. He says, Timothy, why don't you travel with us? 
So I'll presume this. I'll presume that Timothy is significantly younger than Paul. That's why you can call him my son. Most likely, G Paul, Timothy learned about Jesus through Paul. He learned about Yahweh through his mother and grandmother. But he learned about Jesus through Paul. That's why Paul can say, he's my son. Paul begat him in the faith. So Timothy goes with Paul. Paul circumcises him. He's a Jewish man, half Jewish, half Gentile. He's never been circumcised. Paul is going to minister to Jewish people throughout the world. And he knows that if they know he's a Jewish person and not circumcised, they're not going to talk to him. So Paul circumcises him for the sake of the gospel, that there's no hindrance to that. Timothy is so important to Paul. Paul wrote 13 letters. Two of them are written to Timothy that we have in the Bible, 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy. Eight of Paul's remaining 11 letters mentions Timothy in some way. Timothy is at the heart of what Paul does. Think of who else Paul traveled with. Tell me who else Paul traveled with. Think about it. Luke? Titus? I don't ever travel with James, I don't think. Silas? Maybe if Sylvanus and Silas are the same person, it's one. If not, it's two people. Um, who? Barnabas. Barnabas. That's right, Barnabas. Let me see what else I got here. That's good enough. It seems though that Timothy is very special. There are times in Paul's ministry where Paul says, everyone else has left me, but only Timothy's with me. So Timothy is very special into Paul's heart, into, to, to what Paul is doing. At the end of his life, Paul passes the baton on to Timothy to continue the work. That's what the book of 2 Timothy is about. Paul is in prison in Rome. This is the second time. He's in prison in Rome as we read Philippians. But the second time when Paul gets out from this imprisonment and goes and preaches more, and then, then he gets arrested again and put back in prison, and Paul's going to be put to death, and he knows it. And so the book of 2 Timothy is about passing the baton on to Timothy to carry on the ministry of an evangelist and to plant churches. And so the book of 2 Timothy is very personal about Timothy and Paul's relationship. In fact, Paul is, Timothy is probably in Ephesus. Paul's in Rome in prison. And Paul wants Timothy to come join him and to bring the parchments and the scriptures. He, he wants Timothy to bring me the scriptures. It wasn't, it wasn't a book like ours so much. It was a scrolls. Bring me the scriptures. I need them in jail. So listen to Paul's words to Timothy in 2 Timothy 1, 3, and 4, to see the heart that they have for each other. Paul says this in 2 Timothy, I thank God, whom I serve with a clear conscience the way my forefathers did. As I constantly remember you, Timothy, in my prayers night and day, longing to see you, even as I recall your tears, so that I may be filled with joy. Paul says, I'm longing to see you even as I recall your tears. We don't know the exact situation here, but at some point, Paul and Timothy parted. And Timothy is crying about it. And Paul so longs to see him so that his joy can be completed. He wants to see Timothy one more time before he is put to death. We don't know if that ever happened. Paul was put to death soon after he wrote those words by Nero. He was beheaded. Because of the preaching of the gospel, Nero killed him. But this is the special place that Timothy has in Paul's heart and in Paul's ministry. So Paul wanted to send Timothy to Philippians because Timothy's concern for the Philippians was greater than anybody else's. In fact, I want to read the text to you here. and We're going to see that it appears that all other Paul's traveling companions have bailed on him. Only Timothy's left. So listen to Philippians 2, 19 to 24. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, so that I too may be cheered by news of you. For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare, for they all seek their own interests. So whoever else Paul's talking about, he has no one like Timothy. All his other traveling companions seem to have left him at this point. They all seek their own interests, but not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy's proven worth. How as a son with the father, he has served with me in the gospel. I hope therefore to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me. And I trust in the Lord that shortly I myself will come also. 
So this is the heart that Paul has for Timothy. This is the commitment Timothy has to the gospel in serving with the Apostle Paul. And so I, just wanna, I want us to explore this idea here where he says this, for they all seek, and he doesn't define them. So I don't want to accuse anybody, but it appears Luke, Silas, Titus, other people who travel with Paul are not available now. For whatever reason, whoever he's talking about is seeking their own interests and not the interests of Christ. But Timothy seeks the interest of Christ. So Timothy is happy to go, as Paul sends him, he is pleased to go and minister to the Philippians. <clears throat> so that phrase, seeking the interest of Christ as opposed to seeking your own, what does that look like for us today? What does it look like for us today individually that instead of seeking our own interests, we seek the interest of Christ? If, in fact, someday some book is written about you and me, I hope there's not this epithet that says, they, or Tony, pursued his own interest and not the interest of Christ. That's not a good thing to have on your headstone, is it? Um, but I don't want this to be about guilt that you're not doing enough. I, I never want that, because here's my belief about guilt. It'll motivate you for a very short time. It doesn't take me long to get over my guilt and go back to my normal behavior. You can move me a little for a time, but not very long. So guilt can't be the motivator. It has to be a relationship with Jesus Christ. That I walk with him every day. I know who he is. His spirit is within me. And understanding what he's done for me then drives me to want to honor him. That's what has to motivate us. And so what are the interests of Christ in our church? What are the interests of Christ in our community? So that, that when God says, you know what, Tony, Matthew, whoever, I want you to pursue the interests of Christ today and not your own. I know you have an agenda today, Tony. And it's not that it's wrong. It's just not my agenda for you today. Pursue my interests, Tony. What's that look like? In one level, it's very individual as God guides each one of us. But the other side, it really goes back to Paul's point he uses the same word in Philippians chapter 2 where he says regard others as more important than yourself and do not merely look out for your own interests but look out for the interest of others so whatever God's plan is for each one of us whatever his individual purposes for us and will in life it involves people so when you say well what does God have for me I don't know what he wants me to do well, I don't either, specifically. But I do know what it involves. The people next to you, in front of you, and behind you, and across the room. You guys should be met with them. You guys always sit over there. You always sit over there. I always stand here. So I'm messing with you. What, what's the, a squirrel? Is that what you said? Yeah. I know. I'm very easily distracted, Leslie. Very easily distracted. Yeah. So, um, what's the greatest commandment? I, you know, and I, I don't know why I ask questions because it's just, I don't understand the word you say. Um, love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it? Love your neighbor as yourself. They're inseparable. They're two sides of the same coin. And so the interest of Christ involves whoever your neighbor is. Then when Jesus was asked, who's my neighbor, <clears throat> what did he say? What parable did he get when he's asked, who's my neighbor? Because, you know, it'd be nice to know if he wants me to love my neighbor, can I be selective about that? I just had a new neighbor move in, but he's a nice guy. He's Bill sitting over here. Um, I don't know him enough yet not to want to love him. But, um, <laughs> Bill, I, I, you're going to learn I'm a smart aleck, Bill. So, um. Um, but what is Jesus' parable when asked, who is my neighbor? Good Samaritan. The good Samaritan. He picks the one Israel hates. Israel hated the Samaritans. But he picks the Samaritan to be the hero of the story. And though the Israelites hated the Samaritans, in this story, the Samaritan loves the Israelite and takes care of him at his own expense, at his own time, at his own energy. And so the point is, Who's your neighbor? Everyone God puts in your way is your neighbor, even if you consider them your enemy. 
That's a high calling. So, <clears throat> Timothy, Paul knew that the Philippians were concerned about him. So I'm sending Timothy to you soon to be an encouragement to you. He'll report about what's going on in my life. And <clears throat> understand when he wrote this, who carried the letter back? Epaphroditus carried the letter back. So Epaphroditus, who we're going to talk about in a minute, arrives before Timothy does with this letter saying, hey, Timothy's coming soon. Get ready for him. But Timothy's heart, when the Philippians are there and Timothy's coming to him, they know Timothy's coming because he cares for us. And Timothy's pursuing the interests of Christ. So this is going to be a wonderful time as someone who loves us is coming to minister to us. Not out of duty, because they love us because of Jesus. So give some thought today to seeking the interest of Christ and not your own. Let's talk about Epaphroditus now. I call him the faithful messenger. First, Timothy was a faithful son. Epaphroditus is the faithful messenger. Let's read from 25 to 30. I thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier and your messenger and minister to my need. Well, look at all those words that describe him. My brother, because he believes in Jesus. My fellow worker, because Epaphroditus was involved in the gospel with Paul. Fellow soldier, which is one of Paul's, he loves to use that imagery, that we are soldiers in this army that's taking the gospel to the world. And your messenger, which is actually the word apostle in Greek, apostolos. And um, so the Philippians sent Epaphroditus to Timothy. So that's why it's translated messenger. And minister to my need. That's all the things that Epaphroditus was sent to be to Paul. For he has been longing for you all and have been distressed because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill, near to death. But God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but he also on me, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I am the more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again, and that I may be less anxious. I want to explore those ideas in a minute here, that, that Paul is so glad that Epaphroditus didn't die, because he said, then I'd have had sorrow upon sorrow. And I'm glad he's home with you now, because when they're reading this, he's come home and brought this letter. And now I can be less anxious. So just keep that idea how much Paul loves the Philippians and Epaphroditus and is concerned about the fact that Epaphroditus was ill to the point of death. And it was, it was a huge burden on Paul because he couldn't do anything about it. So receive him in the Lord with all joy and honor such men, for he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. So let's go back now to Paul's relationship with Philippi. After Paul left Asia on his second missionary journey, he comes across the land, there's this little isthmus of land from Turkey over to Europe, to, to northern Greece or, or Macedonia, whatever it was called then. And Philippi is the first town Paul would come to. And there, we, you know, we've had a couple sermons. Lucas helped me preach a sermon on that. And then John, John McKendricks preached a sermon on when the gospel came to Philippi. You know, Philippian jailer and, and Lydia down by the river. But at some point, Paul had come, brought those people to faith. He wasn't there long. He was there a matter of weeks before he got beat up and chased out of town. But he established this church. And this church fell in love with Paul. And when Paul travels down, from there he comes down from Philippi to Thessalonica, gets beat up, chased out of town. He comes into Berea, and the Bereans want to hear more about the word of God and who Jesus is, but yet people come down from Thessalonica, beat up Paul, and chase him out of town. You see the repeated pattern here? Paul gets down to Athens, and, um, and from there he goes to Corinth. Then when he gets to Corinth, he's there in fear and trembling. He, he's, I think he's tired of being beat up. We talked about this last week. And, and so... God says to him, hey, don't be afraid. I'm with you. Don't be afraid. Preach the word. No one's going to harm you here. But Paul didn't want to charge the Corinthians money for being there. Because he says a laborer is worthy of their wages. Someone who preached the gospel should get their living from the gospel. But Paul did not want to charge the Philippians or take money from them. So they then could say, hey, we made you, Paul. So Paul was a tent maker. Literally, he made tents to sell so he could preach the gospel without charging anybody. The Philippians didn't like that. So the Philippians, who were in poverty themselves, 
sent money to Paul on a regular basis so he could preach the gospel without having to work. And Paul calls them my partners. You guys are my partners in the faith, partners in the gospel. Paul then ends up in jail, back into Rome again, or to the Rome for the first time in jail. And the Philippians are concerned about Paul. So he sends him, he sends Epaphroditus with a gift. And Epaphroditus takes his gift. Remember, jail back then was not like ours today. There's not three square meals, you don't get clothes. You had to take care of yourself in jail. Your friends had to supply for you, or you went without. So the Philippians made sure Paul had what he needed when he was in the Roman jail. And Paul is deeply appreciative. We'll see that in chapter 4. Paul says this in 4.18. I have received everything in full and have an abundance. I am amply supplied, having received from Epaphroditus what you have sent, a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. So this is a relationship between Paul and the Philippian church, and Epaphroditus is their emissary to him. You with me on this so far? So let's talk about him becoming ill. I want you to feel the emotion of Paul. Let's say, let's say you're in, in Philippi today, and you're sick, but your loved ones are in Rome. Let's back it up. You're in Rome, you're from Philippi, but you're in Rome, and you get sick, and your loved ones are in Philippi. How are they gonna find out you're ill? What's that? News of your death, let's not go there yet, okay? <laughs> I mean today, not then, today. I'll text them. They'll know now. They will know within seconds. I'm not doing well. Pray for me. Or come get me. You know? So my point is communication today relieves a ton of anxiety. It creates other problems. We all know that. But it relieves anxiety when you're trying to communicate difficult things to people about your health. Or you learn difficult things about someone's else health. Think back to this day. So Epaphroditus is sent to Rome. That is... Um, probably a thousand miles that Epaphroditus had to travel by land, whether he, he rode a horse or donkey, we don't know, by boat, to get to Paul. It would take weeks to do that, weeks. So the Philippians don't know what's happened to him. He's going with cash. He doesn't have a money order. He's got cash on him. He could get robbed, he could get beat up, he could get killed. He gets there, becomes ill. And somehow word gets back from Rome, back to Philippi. Epaphroditus, the servant you sent, is ill and he might die. So think now the anxiety on the Philippians. They, they don't have up-to-date information about him. The anxiety is rising in them. Fear that that young man we sent out to help Paul might die. And we haven't heard for weeks what's going on with him. Now think of Epaphroditus. He knows his family back home has heard he's ill. And if he lets them know he's not, it's a letter that would be taken that may never arrive. It will take weeks to get there. So do you feel the anxiousness and the anxiety in all this? That was the question. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I know you were so deep in that that you didn't talk to me. That's Paul's point here about sorrow upon sorrow. If Epaphroditus died, I'm already in sorrow being in jail at some level. Now the person sent to minister to me dies while he was trying to help me. Talk about depression. So he wants to send him home so that he's, because he got better. I want to send him home so that my anxiety lessens. Sometimes when we do these letters, and that's why I picked Philippians for one of them. Philippians is a very personal letter. There's some letters that are very impersonal because we don't know what's going on in the church and it's more information and doctrine and I can, I can geek out on that stuff. But the Philippians, this opportunity here is to see a relationship, a relationship of Paul with Timothy, whom he loved. And Timothy would do anything for Paul and he was always available for the purposes and interests of Christ. And Epaphroditus who nearly, who nearly gave his life in ministering to Paul so that Paul then could be strengthened to go preach the gospel when he gets out of jail. Or to preach the gospel while he's in jail. Because you know who he's preaching to in jail? You guys remember? The Praetorian Guard. Caesar's guard is guarding him. It says even the household of Caesar has come to faith. In chapter 4 we'll see that. So Paul's still ministering. But he's hoping to get out. Epaphroditus is there to minister to him. But what I want to do for a moment now 
is I want to look at Paul's complex view of death. We just sang a song that for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I want to read to you Philippians 1, 20 through 24. The first time Paul talks about his death in this passage. Philippians 1, 20 to 24. It is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I'm to live on in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which shall I choose? I cannot tell. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. So what's Paul's opinion about his death? He's okay with it. He's okay with it. He says it's better to be with Jesus. I want to read another passage to you where Paul says similar words. 2 Corinthians 5, verses 6 through 10. Paul says, we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith and not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage, and we'd rather be away from the body at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. So these two passages give us this doctrine called the intermediate state. What happens to you if you're a body and soul? We'll just keep it that simple today. We won't argue body, soul, spirit, and everything else. If you're a body and a soul, the soul is immaterial. The body dies. It appears the soul lives on. These two passages suggest the body is dead, but you're still in the presence of Jesus. Right? And Paul says, way better. Now let's jump back to what we just read in Philippians chapter 2. Paul is full of anxiousness and sorrow if... Epaphroditus dies. So at one point he says, it's better to die and be with Jesus. But God, please don't let Epaphroditus die. Please. You'll just put sorrow upon sorrow upon me. I don't want that. And when he finally gets home, he says, I can be relieved of anxiety now. He's safe home. So how can he have an attitude of, it's okay with me to die, but I don't want Epaphroditus to die. Ever seen that tension before? Everyone in this room has lost somebody they love. In fact, this coming, this coming a week from yesterday, next Saturday, is a funeral from a man from our body. Chuck O'Neill passed away a couple weeks ago. And we're going to have a, a funeral here, if you know Chuck and Cheryl, we'll have a funeral here at 1.30 next Saturday. And Chuck lived a glorious life serving God. But he died on the, on the, on the operating table while he was working on his lungs because he had lung cancer. And... Um, Chuck wanted to live to keep serving Jesus. He, he did. He wanted to live. Is it not in us to want to live? If to die and to be with Christ is better, why do we have this deep yearning to stay alive? I've said this before, that I, I heard this, so it's, it's more of a uh, hearsay, but my understanding is most of us will spend more in the last month or two of our life on medical bills than the entire lifetime before that. Because we are trying to stay alive. And, and you all pray for your loved ones who die. You don't say, oh, gosh, I hope you die quick so you can go be with Jesus. <laughs> there are a certain point where you pray for someone to, to go on. And there's nothing wrong with that. Suffering's been so great. Oh, God, take them. But it's still great. Is it not great sadness on you? So how do we bring these two together? And, and I, I want to, I don't have full understanding. I'm trying to figure it out myself. But I want to suggest to you that death, I'm not suggesting this, Paul says this, death is the enemy. Okay? Death is the enemy. The wages of sin is, and the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 6.23. Death is the enemy. It's not a friend. It's the result of sin. Individual sin and corporate sin, the sin of the world, has brought this death on us. Jesus came to defeat all his enemies. Satan is one, and death is one. Jesus defeated death at the resurrection when he was raised from the dead. And he will defeat death in your life when he raises you from the dead. So I don't want you to think of when you die and go to be with Jesus, that's the final reward. It's not. Death has won. 
There is this thing called the intermediate state where somehow, and, and the Bible hardly talks about it, you guys. This idea of, the, well, we said, let's go to heaven. The idea of going to heaven and all the biblical passages that we get our theology from have to do more with the new heaven and new earth after Jesus returns and raises us from the dead than it does with these two passages. These are the only two clear passages I have found that talk about I will be with Jesus after I die on this earth. That's not our final reward. So, so, so I don't say this stuff at funerals because I'm not trying to, to direct people's thinking. But often I'll hear at funerals, well, you know, Aunt so-and-so is on the walking streets of gold now. She's received her final reward. And, and so, you know, that's not true. Our final reward is at the resurrection. And Paul just said at that time, that that, that time would be the judgment seat of Christ. And, and, and the life will be evaluated. And the blood of Christ and his righteousness will be applied to you and you will be entered into the glorious eternity of walking with Jesus on those streets of goals. But that's after the resurrection. What happens in this life now when I die is very vague in the Bible. And death is the enemy. So let's try and keep these in tension here. Paul says, it's okay if I die to be with Jesus. I, I'm okay with that. It's better than being alive right now in this jail. But then, but I don't want Epaphroditus to die. Oh, please, God, don't let him die. As Paul knew death was in him. Let me read to you a few verses. 1 Corinthians 15. I'm right in the middle of a context. Paul says, you know, then comes the end. Jesus is coming back. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. That's Jesus', Jesus victory over the demonic realm. For he must reign until he puts all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is, okay, because it's an enemy. And it's destroyed how? When Christ raised us from the dead. Later on in the same chapter, verses 54 and 58, I, I read these at graveside services. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, this is talking about our physical body. This perishable body dies and goes into the ground and decays. But the resurrection, this perishable body will put on the imperishable and the mortal puts on the immortality. Then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. That is the resurrection, is the victory over death. So I, I wanted to bring an opportunity here that we can kind of mature up a bit in our thinking about death. When you die, if you know Jesus Christ, you go to be with him. But we know very little what that's like. The Bible gives very, very little details about that intermediate time. Most of the teaching on life after death is after the resurrection. That's where we get the imagery of streets of gold. The new Jerusalem comes down, whether you take that as literal or figurative. And there's life on this earth. The tree of life is restored again. And we are fully and completely redeemed and changed. And one of my favorite singers from, from the um, early 70s and 80s, his name's Phil Keggy. You guys know Phil Keggy? He had a song called, Oh, What a Day That Will Be. Think about that. That day when death is destroyed, all things are made right, Christ is reigning, all his enemies are in subjection to him, and the last death to be defeated, the last enemy to be defeated is death, and you stand there, glorious, righteous, never to die again, immortal. Oh, what a day that will be. That's why the Bible ends on this prayer. Revelation, the last, second to last verse of Revelation says, Come, Lord Jesus. I want that day to come. Until then, God has given us this internal drive to stay alive. When our loved ones die, it's great sadness on us. There's tears, there's mournings. We prayed, God, don't let them die, keep them alive. But we're all going to die. But that's not loss of hope. There's a temporal time when you'll be with Jesus, and then he will return and reunite you to your body to live forever with him. Remember the old passage about there's, my father has many rooms in his house? We tend to think that's fulfilled when I die. But it says, I will come again to get you and take you there. See, that's not death now, I go to him. That's the second coming when he returns and raises us from the dead. Then it's fulfilled that we live in the father's house, whatever that means. So this is something for you to think about. If I'm messing with your thinking, go to the scriptures and think through it. Send me an email. I'll pass it on to Ron. And um, 
<laughs> um, all right, let, let's get back to Epaphroditus. Risking your life for others. It says there at the end, Receive him in the Lord with all joy and honor such men, for he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his, his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. So this kind of ups the ante from the advice we learned from Timothy. Timothy said, in, in Timothy's advice, it was, it was, others have their own interests. They seek their own interests. But Timothy, you seek the interests of Christ. Well, Epaphroditus, seeking the interests of Christ, was to come minister to Paul, and he nearly died. Paul says, honor men like him, because he nearly died for the work of Christ. What does that mean for us? I, I, I doubt many of us in this room have been called to go such, a, such, a, such situations where I may die fulfilling what God's called me to do. A few of you in here might have done that. But most of us live a pretty reasonably safe life. Agree? Um, would you ever think about that? That are you willing to put your life on the line for somebody else to obey God? My oldest son is 39 years old. And that's where you say, you have a 39-year-old? <laughs> How is that possible? I hate it when I have to ask for a compliment. <laughs> I remember when I dedicated him as a baby, the minister looked at us and said, do you promise not to hinder your son from going to the mission field if that's where God calls him? I remember thinking, why would somebody hinder their child from going to the mission field? If my son wants to go to the mission field, I'll be so excited for him. But I've learned since then, parents regularly hinder their children from going to the mission field because they're afraid for them. Because sometimes bad things happen on the mission field. And so that, that as I, my son grew up, I thought, my goodness, could I say goodbye to him? wonder if I ever see him again. And that's what the minister was asking me that day. As I dedicated my child to the Lord, are you willing to let him go, even if it means certain death, as he goes to minister for Jesus? I think we need to think about that, all of us. We don't go put ourselves in situations because we're um, um, adrenaline freaks that want to be in danger. I'm speaking to some of you young guys out there. But God calls. Sometimes we need to step into things and say, you know, whether I live or die, I just want to glorify God when I'm in this body. Epaphroditus did. He didn't know what he was getting into. He didn't know he's going to take, he thinks he's just taking a gift, a free trip to Rome. Who wouldn't do that? But when he gets there, he finds out what it costs. We don't know what his illness was. Um, so I hope that I have the trust in God that whatever he calls me to do, that I will follow him. So just some reminders. Do you and I have the interest of Christ as foremost in our lives? over our own personal interests? Do you have the single focus walk with Christ that if he called us to, we would even risk our lives to do his will? And as a reminder, our ultimate hope and our final salvation is the resurrection. If I die, it's because death is the, is, has won. Death, I, tell, I say this, death has won a battle, but they're not the victor. You get that? When I die, it's because ultimately a battle was won and death temporarily has taken me out. But death is not the victor. Who is? Jesus Christ. Let's thank him now. Father, we do thank you. And Jesus, give you great praise for what you did for us as we've been learning this book here, Lord, that you gave us. Jesus, you humbled yourself, became human, and went to the point of death and murdered on a cross, the death of a slave, the death of a, a rebellious slave you took for us. And you've restored us back to a walk with your Father. And you've been raised up, Lord, given the name above every name, and every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that you are the Lord, Jesus. And so today we do that once again. We bow our knees to you and say, Lord, we are yours. Keep renewing our hearts and minds to truth, getting rid of lies that, just, that take us away from you and your purposes for us. And, um, and use us, Lord. Use us in the little things in our neighbor's lives, our friend's lives. And Lord, even call us to big things that we have to trust in you, that if you're not in it, it would fail miserably, Lord. So help us to step into those things that you're working and you want to use us in. So build our faith. 
because you are worthy of everything we have. Thank you, Christ. In your name, we give praise to your Father. Amen.